before we can actually talk about why we may not want to use decisions uh, and decision aids, and we have to kind of understand what the context in which decision making is done. And, well, one way in which we can do that is to actually understand a real-life decision. So uh, let's use an example of something that I had to do literally seven days ago. Um, and I mean literally seven days ago. Uh, so that panic look across the pet organizer's faces is that slow realization that I'm not set in on a talk with a time limit that I've only had a maximum of seven days to practice. So decisions are difficult, right? That's our first point. Seven days ago, I'm sitting around a table in beautiful Anaheim, California, with some of my best friends, and we are toasting the end of a wonderful conference. We're having some food. I go to bed thinking when I wake up uh, on Sunday, I'm just going to board a plane, go home, no problem whatsoever. In fact, when I wake up, airline calls me and tells me, hey, your flight's been canceled, and you've been rebooked on a flight two days later. I have to teach on Monday, so now I have to decide, do I cancel class, or do I try to find a flight that gets me home with another airline? Uh, the airline comes back and says, well, actually, we can book you on a flight from LAX to Boston. That's a red eye, which means that you're getting at 2.30 in the morning, and then at 2.30 in the morning, I have to drive from Boston to Hartford. Okay, well, I might be able to make that happen, but what's the safety of driving there? Well, how do I get from Anaheim to LAX? And you can start to see why decisions start to become really difficult. The other side of decision making that makes it particularly hard is that we aren't always going to make the right decision. Which is the right choice in this case? Do I take the red eye, risk the drive, but I get to teach my class possibly, or do I just say cancel class and take my normal flight home that gets me to my car, right? My car isn't working. Now, I've already canceled class to go to this conference to begin with, so now I'm stuck. So these decisions that I have to make, there doesn't need to be a right option. So not only are decisions difficult, I'm sometimes going to make mistakes. Well, the third part of decision making is that, well, unfortunately, we only have to make decisions all of the time. You can see why they ask me to go first. Right? I have to feel depressed at the end of the conference with all this negativity about decision making. No, we're not particularly good at making decisions, and we have to make them all the time, and that presents a particularly difficult situation for us. So, when trying to decide between Taking the red eye from LAX to Boston versus canceling class, I have to decide, well, can I find a hotel on a day's notice in Anaheim? So then when we up in Anaheim, it's the home of Disney World, uh, and therefore it's constantly packed with people. If I want to get to LAX, how do I get to LAX? Do I take a $100 cab ride? Do I take a $60 car rental? Uh, then I have to fight that LA traffic, right, which is terrible. Uh, it's so rare that you get an opportunity to put a price tag on commute-related sanity. Uh, on this day, it was worth $40. The other option is a variable price shuttle. Now, the variable price shuttle works based on the premise that I pay depending on how many bucks are in that shuttle going where I'm going. So, Sunday morning, 8 o'clock in the morning, how many people are going to be going from Anaheim, California to Los Angeles, let alone LAX? I'm trying to think, well, what's going on in L.A.? Is there anything that people might be flying in from Anaheim to, uh, to get to L.A. for? And the point here is that what makes decision-making particularly difficult in most of our lives is that we are going to be making important decisions in a context in which we have limited information, when time is of the essence, and we may not know what to do. Add to this the fact that our intuition often plays tricks on us. And I know it is nearly 10 o'clock in the morning, I'm just a bundle of optimism. Nothing but the decisions to make in our life. We make them poorly. We can't even trust ourselves to do it. Right? To be sure, and to be clear, there are individuals out there who are considered to have expert intuition. These are individuals who can read a situation and know exactly what to do in that situation. And more times than not, it's actually going to work out for them. Right? Fire commanders are a great example. Test grand masters are another one. They look at a situation and they know, I know, I've been here before, I know what to do. Most of us will never have that opportunity. To develop this, you need years of training and years of experience and years of feedback. I'm sorry to tell you that none of us or most of us in this room will never have a chance to actually train our decision-making, train our intuition with enough repetitiveness to actually end up where we're better off, where we can look at a situation and say, I know what I'm supposed to do right now. There is hope, though. Right? There is hope. And that's what the point of today. There's hope in the form of decision-making. And I acknowledge that in the grand scheme of the world, my flight back to Hartford wasn't a difficult decision or wasn't necessarily the most important decision that we're going to have to make. But we will be faced in our lives with decisions that are large-scale important. 
right? There is more than a handful of you in this room that will be asked at some point or another to make a decision about whether or not someone should be hired. Our intuitions, our clinical judgments, play tricks on us in these situations. And they make unimportant features of this uh, candidate seem important when they're not. Things like someone's age, or physical appearance, or in the case of this work here, a rumor about an applicant is unrelated to their job in most cases. Yet, when I presented a rumor to a group of people, they didn't ignore the fact that it's a rumor. If I told you I was going to hire you based on whether or not I heard a rumor about you, none of you would say, like, that's okay. Yet, the people who are actually making these decisions in the study said, actually, it's pretty useful. All they really distinguished between was whether or not that information was positive or negative. There's an allure to a rumor. There's a lot of uh, sexiness to a rumor. And we think that it's important. You will be asked to decide how to allocate your retirement portfolio to maximize your retirement data. I use the word allocate retirement portfolio, and I know for a fact there's more than a handful of you that have no idea what I just said. This is an important financial decision to make, and yet it'll be very difficult for most of us to do that. The Bureau of Labor Statistics data here shows that a surprising number of employees aren't even engaging in their employer's retirement options. And despite the fact that if I took a poll right now and said, how important is it to save for, college, uh, save for the future, save for retirement, all of you would say, yeah, that's really important. But how do you go about doing that? It's a difficult decision. We don't know. We don't have a lot of information about it. And I hope this never happens to you, but you may end up in a situation where you have to make an important medical decision for yourself or for a family member. And what do you do in these situations, especially when time is short, when the stakes are high and information is limited? Do I take the quicker but higher risk surgical options, or do I take the longer road medical intervention, but it has less risk? These are not particularly easy options, but we have to somehow choose between them. But there is hope, right? And there is hope in the way of decision tools or decision aid. And what I mean by decision aid, and I'm going to use uh, my own definition, it's something that we can use that helps us separate an option from something else or help us provide some more information to get a better guess at what we think is the right choice. So you've actually probably used decision aids a lot more than you've realized. And anytime you try to choose between two restaurants and you flip a coin, you're using that coin as an aid, right? One of my personal favorites, my magic eight ball here. Should I have agreed to give this TED talk? Oh boy. Reply hazy, try again. Of course, I'm kidding, right? Uh, these are not actual decision aids that I'm talking about. The decision aids that we'll be talking about today are ones that are actually been shown to be related to the outcome. The idea being that using these decision aids actually is related to a successful decision outcome. Right? I'll bring this point up again toward the end, but I just want to remind you, we're not talking about a guaranteed 100% this is going to be the best decision when we talk about using these decision aids. We're trying to talk about, we're, I'm telling you about things that are going to be related to a possible better outcome. So, coin flips and magic eight balls aside, which are completely unrelated to having a successful outcome, things like a pro con list. Right? Benjamin Franklin is often credited with inventing the pro con list. We populate this list with things for and against an option, and, and whichever side wins is the one we take. And these are usually helpful, and we can help kind of clarify our thinking about our option. But the problem with the pro con list is that it takes time to produce. I've never seen anyone produce a pro con list while sitting in an airport trying to decide whether or not to take a flight. Of course, you've probably never seen that either because no one's probably trying to make a physical decision in an airport. The other side of the pro con list that makes it particularly challenging is that it really focuses our thinking on a single alternative. Do I take this option, yes or no? We know that to a certain extent, increasing our choice that helps us make better decisions. Well, and a pro-con list really just focuses in on a single option. There's a big push toward data-driven decision-making, where I offer you information and data about an option, and you're supposed to be able to tell me whether or not you want to take that option. So if I tell you that if you use a structured interview, you can estimate 26% of the variance in job performance, you know for a fact that you want to use a structured interview, right? No, of course not, because we don't understand what variance means. Most of us, it takes a special kind of nerve, high, that's me, to really understand and see if it's variance accounted for, or reduction in risk. So the numerical information is supposed to give you information about the relationship between an outcome and a choice, 
but it's also presented in a way that we don't understand. Um, as, as noted, I'm an industrial organizational psychologist, and in the world of IO psychology, we've known for quite some time that using a structured selection system, one in which the information about a candidate is collected in a systematic way and integrated in a systematic way, results in better hiring outcomes than things like the study of handwriting or age, which you might think, well, that's kind of silly. No one does that, right? Some people still do. Uh, but also, a traditional unstructured interview where you ask someone questions that aren't necessarily the same for each group. Like, these are interviews that everyone has been a part of. And yet, we can't get people to use these systems. What ends up happening with these systems is you're compared as an applicant to another applicant, apples to apples. No, no uh, sort of intuition involved so much. Or less intuition involved might be the better way to say it. So we know that these work because it allows people to be compared directly. Except we also know that using these systems increases the perceived threat to your uh, role as a decision maker. The more a potential user of a structured selection system views the selection system as being controlling and offering a stable outcome, the more they perceive their role as a decision maker to be threatened, the threat of technological unemployment, then the less likely they are to want to use that system. And that makes sense psychologically. If my work as a person is going to be challenged by a machine, I don't want to use that machine. You can think of John Henry, the steel driving man. Add to that the possibility that you might be perceived as less able, less professional, and less thorough if you use a decision aid. So in this study, physicians who use a decision aid to help make a diagnosis of a patient actually made better diagnoses on average than someone who just used their intuition alone, a physician who just used their intuition alone. But those patients viewed that original decision maker as less thorough, less professional, right? less able. So it's not surprising to me to tell when you tell me that, hey, I don't want to use a decision aid that's going to make me feel like I could be replaced by a computer or I can be viewed as less like right? These are natural reactions. The last uh, decision aid we might talk about is advice. We often turn to loved ones or important others for advice on how to make a decision, but not all advice is the same. Right? Sometimes you can be given advice on just information about the decision. And we like that, right? The vertical line is call us to that power. We like when we're just given information. We are we do not like when someone tells us to do something or not to do something. I think about the last time you told someone, don't do that. There's a few parents in the room that are like, yes, no, that doesn't work. But you can't tell someone not to do something. Because what do you want to do? You actually want to rebel against that, you want to do it anyway. And that's essentially what recommending for an option or recommending against an option is. You should do this or you shouldn't do that. Our sense of control was taken away, our sense of freedom was taken away, we resist against that. My point here is that we have these really well-validated selection of these really well-validated decision aids. We can use these to help make better decisions, yet we don't like to use them because of a psychologically protected reason. They're uncomfortable to use. I was sitting in an airport, and loved ones were telling me, uh, giving me good advice. They were saying, I think you should, but as soon as they said you should, I had an automatic visceral reaction to don't tell me what to do. And I study this, and I read this on a regular basis. These are fundamentally uh, ingrained in But there is hope, right? There is hope, and this is something that my friends and I take very seriously because of the decisions that we study. We study who should be hired, and we never take lightly the fact that if I tell someone to be hired, I'm telling someone that they shouldn't be hired. And that's something that I never forget. And so before an organization tells an applicant, thank you, but you didn't get the job, I want to make sure that they had all the right information at their disposal. So how can we go about making decision aids more useful and helping people understand how useful they are? Well, the first thing that we have to probably do is probably talk to people in ways that they actually understand. And the way that we talk about this is communicating a best size information, or communicating how effective these aids are. We may not understand relative risk reduction. You may not understand the correlation coefficient, right, the blue line. I do, but I'm a nerd, right? I sit here. When I go home today, I'm going to read more about this stuff because that's all I do. But not many people do. But instead, if you present the numerical information, either in the way of, like, here's how effective the outcome would be if you made this decision, or, hey, if you use this selection system, here's how much better your decisions might be. If I present that in a way that people have to understand, like a common language effect size statistic or a binomial effect size display, they actually seem to like it better. They understand it and they can perceive actually how effective it is. Right? By the way, these two other statistics, 
they just present information in percentages which are a little bit easier to understand than something like a correlation like this. You can also use pictures, right? Icon arrays put onto, uh, in front of somebody, the perception of how effective something is based on sort of counts or frequencies. Like these are really simple interventions, yet surprisingly use very little to actually communicate to people some of these things about the frequency. Right. What, what these three things do, the common language effect size, statistics, the binomial effect size display, what they do is they actually communicate to people in a way that actually takes advantage of our natural inclination to understand uh, percentages and values and numbers. The other thing that I'd like to uh, sort of leave you think about is the fact that a decision aid and the way that my friends and I would try to talk to you if you're ever in an organization and we're trying to convince you to use one is not to try to convince you to think about a decision aid replacing A decision aid cannot replace a decision maker. A decision aid is strictly meant to provide you with information to help you make a better decision. And that aligns with another really important point. I know I mentioned this before, I'll say it again. A decision aid is not going to guarantee you a great decision. It's just going to help you get closer to a better decision than using just the intuition. So you are not going to be replaced by a computer. You're not going to be replaced by an algorithm. You're not going to be replaced by a Ouija board, despite the number of decisions you made that you thought would have been made better with a Ouija board. If you don't know what a Ouija board is, you can look it up there. You're not. And an example might be helpful. Super recognizers are a group of people who have an innate ability to recognize and remember faces. And there was a recent study that showed that super recognizers, these people who can remember faces, did just as well as the computer at matching people's passport pictures to their faces. So you might think, well, then just use the computer. So it's just a bit of a human, you don't have to pay a computer. But if you dig, dig deeper into that study, you learn that a super recognizer, with the help of the decision aid computer, performed the best. The situation that I'm trying to impart to you is that it's decision aid plus decision maker. It's not one or the other. And that's how you can improve your decision. So yes, decisions are difficult, and you're going to have to make a lot of them in your life. And you may not make the right choice every time. But when you're faced with a really difficult decision, and you're offered the opportunity to use a decision aid, consider it, and perhaps even listen to it. But don't let it determine it for you. Because a decision aid is a should help, and it should be able to help you. Thank you.